Many have heard of the Little Boy and Fat Man, the nuclear weapons that were dropped on Japan in World War II, but not everyone has heard about the Littlest Boy. The bombs dropped then were designed for mass destruction, and the immense human toll has so far prevented nuclear weapons from being used in combat since then. Instead, the Littlest Boy was built for smaller-scale recurring combat. It was a tiny but still deadly nuclear device that was crafted by the United States in the 1960s during the booming age of nuclear development and design. During this nuclear arms race, the West was considering options for increasing its dominance on the ground in case of an armed conflict. Portable nukes became not only a theoretical solution, but were already manufactured and trained with. Littlest Boy, small and true to its name, marked a step in what could have been a chilling evolution of nuclear arms. This new weapon also went by the name of Backpack Nuke, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was hoped that the Littlest Boy would be powerful enough to win a battle, but small enough to avoid international outcry. The United States Army had the threat of the Soviet Union and the Vietnam War in mind in 1972. Despite an intense aerial bombing campaign in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, the nation was gaining little ground against the Viet Cong. The time was ripe for military innovation, and the Army put out a call for volunteers for a highly secret and highly specialized training mission. Captain Tom Davis and his Special Forces A-Team, all Vietnam vets and among the most skilled and highly trained soldiers from the conflict, answered. The mission called for them to be trained on how to use the Special Atomic Demolition Munitions, or SADMs, nuclear weapons designed for easy transportation and on-the-ground detonation. Training involved war simulation games as a team. Only soldiers with the best records and most experience from elite Army Engineer and Special Forces units were considered for these teams, as well as Navy SEALs and selected Marines. They were screened by the Department of Defense's Personnel Reliability Program to ensure they were trustworthy and mentally stable. For one of these training exercises, Captain Davis's team practiced a protocol for deployment in Eastern Europe. With tactical planning and making use of their skills, they had to trek densely forested mountains to destroy the target, a heavy water plant used to manufacture nuclear weapons. The team had been briefed by Army regional experts on routes of infiltration and anticipated enemy patrols. Aerial photos and an elaborate mock-up of the target were all tirelessly studied, all in preparation for testing of the latest nuclear device. Reaching the site called for an airdrop, and the paratroopers had to jump out of their plane with nearly 70 pounds of gear in addition to the 30 pounds of parachute rigging. Hanging precariously from each man's parachute harness would be a 58-pound nuclear bomb inside a container. In essence, the idea was to parachute men in with miniature nuclear bombs attached to them. The portable nuclear destruction device carried was the B-54 SADM. After landing at the site, each team member had to scurry to a predetermined rally point, where he would carefully unseal the special jump container to assess the state of the contents. Each paratrooper needed to check to ensure that their payload was intact, that is, not leaking any radiation. The soldiers would then bury the container and place the device back in their rucksack or backpack to set forth, with only the night covering them on their unique mission. It was planned that each man would then lay the device against a wall or other part of a pre-designated target, crank up the timers, and run away as quick as possible, leaving the device behind to let nuclear fission take its course. About using these bombs, team member Mark Bentley de Pere would later come to say that if they were ever sent into real combat situations, quote, we all knew it was a one-way mission, a suicide mission. Of course, none of this actually took place in Eastern Europe. The whole exercise was carried out by the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. Instead of the targeted heavy water plant, the army used a closed-down paper mill in the nearby town of Lincoln. Instead of an SADM, the team used a dummy. Still, preparations were being made for eventual integration to warfare. The SADM would allow the Special Forces units dubbed Green Light Teams to deploy behind enemy lines in order to destroy infrastructure and wreak havoc. This included being prepared to deploy SADMs in Eastern Europe itself to prevent any invasion. The miniaturization of nuclear devices was well underway by the 1960s. 
At that time, scientists and technicians at the nuclear weapons laboratories in Los Alamos and Sandia had succeeded in miniaturizing the so-called packages at the core of atomic bombs. Warheads had gone from the nearly 10,000 plus pound used in the first ever nuclear test to much smaller, lighter versions that could fit atop a missile. The army had been on the back foot when it came to nuclear weapons, as the first nuclear-equipped bombers and nuclear missiles were managed by the Air Force and Navy. Fortunately for the army, some American strategists still viewed nukes as conventional bombs, bigger and more destructive, but still conventional. And that rationalization is how nuclear technology was able to make its way into the Army's arsenal and testing grounds. The development of atomic demolition munitions, or ADMs, by the Army began back in 1954. Early versions were cumbersome and required several men to carry them with the help of trucks and helicopters. Their initial objective was to manage nuclear landscaping, meaning to create irradiated craters or mountainside collapses onto narrow passes that could in turn obstruct accessible invasion routes that could be targeted by enemy forces. A 1960s field manual issued by the Army taught soldiers to use ADMs for stream cratering, which meant setting off atomic explosions near small waterways so as to form temporary dams or lakes and cause flooding, all in the name of thwarting and impeding enemy forces. More ordinary targets like infrastructure, such as bridges, railways, power plants, and airports, were also considered as part of this in-the-path potential nuclear strategy. Additionally, the Army wanted arms or devices of a smaller scale for more pinpointed ground battles. Many strategists and military experts believed that the future of warfare lay in small skirmishes rather than battles on a grand scale. That's why James McRae, the president of the nuclear arms maker Sandia Corporation, recommended that there should be a greater emphasis on small atomic weapons, which could be used for these types of smaller scale ground combats. The first of these small scale nuclear weapons was dubbed the Davy Crockett. It was a sub kiloton yield nuclear rocket that could fit on the back of a Jeep. Eventually, the model morphed into the B-54 Special Atomic Demolition Munition, or SADM. SADM entered the U.S. arsenal in 1964. It stood just 18 inches tall and was encased in an aluminum and fiberglass frame with a 12-inch diameter control panel on one side. The weapon's explosive yield was between 10 tons and 1 kiloton, equal to about 10,000 tons of TNT, far less than the Little Boy, which exploded with about 15 kilotons but still enough to cause significant damage to an enemy force. As a security measure, the SADM's control panel was sealed by a cover plate with a combination lock. Glow-in-the-dark paint was applied to the lock so a soldier could unlock the miniature nuclear bomb in the dark. During most of the Cold War, the United States and its NATO allies were arguably at a disadvantage. American and NATO forces were outnumbered by the Communist Soviet Union and fellow Warsaw Pact countries in terms of manpower and conventional armaments. In the eyes of these nations, especially the United States, there needed to be some sort of unconventional tool to level the playing field. From those considerations came the obsession with portable nuclear weapons. For the West, nuclear arms were increasingly seen as the best equalizer in this military tug of war between the two sides. This philosophy had commenced back in the 1950s when then-President Dwight Eisenhower decided that the best way to deter Soviet aggression and military superiority was to build an arsenal of aggressively superior technology, that is to say, with nuclear arms. The tactic was dubbed massive retaliation. This massive retaliation strategy had a major flaw, however. Though this retaliation was economical and easily managed, it gave the United States almost no flexibility in terms of scaled response to a Soviet attack. This was especially true in the case of a limited non-nuclear attack, in which the Soviets and their allies had superior conventional forces and arms. It would be extremely challenging to weigh using a destructive bomb in response to a minor infantry attack, for example. This was how the concept of a limited nuclear war was born. Were it to work, nuclear arms would then be used strategically at a smaller scale. Of course, these so-called small weapons were sometimes more powerful than the nuclear bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
opposed to the end of World War II. It would have meant massive radiation and civilian destruction across huge swaths of territory. Ultimately, the SADMs were never put to practical use. Having soldiers enter a chaotic combat zone with nuclear devices in their backpacks risk overreactions that may have had disastrous consequences, both for the enemy, the troops deployed, and allied countries. The soldiers themselves would be walking into immediate danger. In the words of Mark Bentley, quote, You set your timer, and it would click when it went off, or it went ding, or I forget what, but you knew you were toast. NATO allies, particularly in what was then West Germany, were understandably apprehensive about the idea of U.S. forces trekking through their territory, or even through nearby territory with portable nuclear weapons. An accident could set off backpack nukes inside these partnering nations. In 1991, the USSR fell, taking the need for ultimate anti-Soviet weapons away with it. The George H.W. Bush administration slashed the budget for non-strategic nuclear weapons, and that was the beginning of the end for these portable bombs. The SADM was finally withdrawn as an option for military use in 1989. 